Hey everyone, my name's Carlos, and welcome to Christ Community Church. We still have a few minutes before our service begins, so check out what's happening this week at CCC. If this is your first time here, let me just say how glad we are that you chose to make CCC a part of your Sunday. To give you an idea of what our time is going to look like, we're going to sing a few songs together that focus our hearts on Jesus. Then later in our service, we're going to hear a great message from one of our pastors. We'd love to have the opportunity to meet you today at our Next Steps area out in the atrium. If you're a mom of a preschooler, registration for the upcoming MOPS ministry year is now open. This is a great place where you can connect to a community of women who meet together to embrace and encourage one another in the journey of motherhood. You can find out more details on how to register online. At the beginning of the summer, our elders blessed and encouraged our lead pastor, Mark Ashton, to take a sabbatical. This is an intentional time of resting in the Lord apart from the normal day-to-day -day responsibilities and pressures of ministry. We're looking forward to when Mark will be back with us on August 5th. So in the meantime, we want to encourage you to continue praying for Mark and his family. Service is about to begin. For more details about what we've mentioned today, go online to cccomaha.info.
we have in him. We invite you to sing along. to Christ Community Church. It's so good to see you today. In fact, everybody just look to somebody you're standing next to right now and say, I am so glad you're here today. Man, this is the glorious hope that we get to gather every single day on Sunday together as God's people to sing the praises of Jesus, to celebrate the glorious resurrection that he has conquered the grave and death and that same promise is true for you and for me because of our faith in him. That's good news today. Well, we're gonna sing a few more songs just like that one that point our hearts 
and our minds upon our affection toward Jesus. If you're new here today or joining us online, I mean, I certainly invite you to sing along with us and uh, let these words just kind of speak to your heart and soul as we uh, sing together. And uh, before we continue anything more, I wanna give you an opportunity to have a little bit longer of a conversation today. I know you just said that you're glad to see somebody. Go ahead and find somebody you've never met before. Introduce yourself to them. This is part of being the family of God is developing a community of believers. So find someone new, tell them that you're good, uh, tell them your name, get to know something about them, and then we're gonna continue singing in just a moment. Do that now.
that you're not by my side and there won't be a day that you let me fall and all of my life your love will be true and with all of our a day that you weren't by my side. There won't be a day that you won't be there. There won't be a day that you won't come through, God. I just want you to pause for a moment right now and just think inwardly of a circumstance, a time in your life, maybe where it was just extremely hard, and yet God in his goodness and his faithfulness has carried you through. And sometimes those, those circumstances, they feel overwhelming. They feel like there's no end in sight. And I can tell you from experience that I've had seasons of life like that. But the truth is that God is faithful, that he is loving, and that he is with us, he is with you. And this is why we worship God, this is why we sing, because he is transcendent over all of our existence. And his goodness and his faithfulness and all he does is worth celebrating and is worth singing songs like this one to him. I wanna do something before we enter into our last song of the morning, and I just wanna take a moment where we can just ponder the goodness of God in your own life. And maybe if you've had that time where it's been hard to see him, remember the truth, God is with me. God is with me, he is faithful. I just wanna take a moment to just rest in his presence, because I think rest is so good, and our life moves at 100 miles an hour, and I think that there's times where we can gather as a community of believers and just rest in the presence of God. So we're gonna do that right now. We're gonna give you a moment just to rest in God's presence. you are so good and you are so faithful and you sent your son Jesus so that by his life and his work and his resurrection and his promise to us that if we put our faith in him that we can experience these things too that we can have not only our sin forgiven and a hope of a glorious future but that we can experience a deep abundant life here and now on earth as it is in heaven. Church, let's sing this last song about Jesus together.
do turn to you today. We acknowledge your king, that you are the king of all, that you are the object of our affection, of our worship, of our adoration. You are the hope and the future that we have in our lives. We put our lives firmly upon you. And Lord Jesus, we ask that you help us to be aware that you are here with us now, that you are present with us through your spirit. And we uh, are just so grateful for that. We're grateful for the grace that you pour out over our lives. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. How do you teach your kids about the Bible? It's one of those huge questions that parents ask themselves all the time. This fall, we'll be launching into a brand new series that will teach the Bible to parents and kids alike from cover to cover. It'll have resources like this that will include all of the narrative portions of the Bible for the adults to read, and then matching resources for parents to read with elementary school kids or preschool kids so that you can be empowered to learn the Bible and teach the Bible with your family every single time. It all starts on August 12th with the launch of the story. I'll be back to teach that, and we will be equipping every generation to learn the Bible from cover to cover. Don't miss it. Welcome again to Christ Community Church. My name is Tiffany and I serve on staff here at CCC as a spiritual formation and prayer resident. And I am so excited to see all of these seats filled with your wonderful faces this morning. We have a great morning planned. And so thank you for choosing to spend your Sunday with us. At this time, I would like to invite the ushers forward for a time where we get to worship God with our giving. And if you are new this morning, please feel no pressure or obligation to give. Feel free to just sit back and allow the plates to pass you by. But if you are someone that calls CCC your home and you come every Sunday ready to give or you're giving online, we want to say thank you. It's because of your faithful and sacrificial giving that we are able to share the love of Jesus right here in our very own city and throughout the world. So again, we could not do this without you, so thank you for giving. Just like we saw in that video, Pastor Mark talked about something awesome happening on August 12th. We are launching a church-wide series called The Story. And it, we're gonna have generation to generation reading the narrative portions of the Bible from cover to cover together. And we believe that it's gonna unite families, it's gonna unite friends, and it's gonna unite our entire church. We are very excited for this day and for this series. And in an effort to get you guys prepared for it, starting next Sunday, July 15th, we are going to be selling copies of the story and other resources that go along with it. So again, next Sunday, you can pick up those resources out in the atrium at the resources booth. So that's not the only thing happening on August 12th. There's something else exciting happening, but I'm gonna need like a drum roll for this because it's pretty epic. So can everybody help me here? On August 12th, we are having the grand reopening of our worship center. Can we praise God for that? Oh, we're so excited, guys. We have been waiting with patience and eagerness to have this happen, and we are almost there. We've almost reached the completion of the worship center. So on August 12th, we are going to come together to celebrate God's faithfulness in all of this. We believe that this newly redesigned space will be a beautiful place to come together, to gather, to worship, to pray, and to grow in our faith for decades of future ministry. It's gonna be really exciting. And guys, we couldn't have done this without you though. So we also wanna say thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your flexibility and thank you for your grace as you guys consistently and continuously moved for the mission. August 12th is gonna be a Sunday that is gonna be unforgettable and you won't wanna miss, so don't forget to mark your calendars. And also be in prayer about who you would love to invite to embark on the story series with you as well. Well, this Sunday morning, we are in week four of a seven-week series 
through the book of Titus, and we are about to hear a powerful message from my first boss and middle school pastor, Alex Ely. But before we get to that, I want to invite you guys, if you need a Bible, we actually have some in the back of the gym for you. And if you don't own a Bible, feel free to take it home with you and consider it our gift to you. At this time, though, I'd like to prepare our hearts for the message, so I'd ask that you pray with me at this time. Dear God, you are good. Thank you for being holy, God. Thank you for being sovereign, and thank you for being faithful. God, thank you for loving us exactly where we are in this moment and for calling us here to hear your truth this morning. God, we confess that our hearts and our minds are filled with thoughts right now and maybe not even thoughts of you, God. And so we just graciously lay them at your feet. And we pray that you go before us in preparing our hearts and our minds to receive the truth and the love that you have for us this morning. God, will you anoint Pastor Alex with your words? Will you allow his love and the grace that flows through him be not his own, but yours alone, God? Will you allow hearts to mend, hearts to break, and hearts to receive what you have for us today, God? And we ask all of these things in your son, Jesus Christ's name, who died for us so that we could be saved and hear your word and receive your love today. Amen. Hey, good morning, everyone. How are we? Sound good. Uh, I've been living uh, for the last few months inside of a chaotic world uh, called four- and five-year-old T-ball, okay? I think if I asked the room, uh, hey, what would you rather do, herd uh, cattle or would you rather herd four- and five-year-olds? Most of you would moo out loud because you'd rather uh, herd cattle. It's a crazy, crazy Uh, thing to try to do. And every year, for some reason, there is uh, somebody who I would consider a saint who's handed um, a roster and a t-shirt that says coach on the back. Hopefully, they have internet connection to YouTube videos to try to learn how to teach and and organize this group of little kids playing baseball. Uh, Luckily for me, uh, when my wife tried to sign me up to be the coach, I lucked out. Somebody else had already done that. And so uh, I decided to help out at practices, go to the games, try to teach my son a little bit in the backyard over the last year. And as we've done this, uh, there were a few simple things that the coach wanted to teach four- and five-year-olds to get the game of baseball. For us, like we watch the CWS and we understand that easy. It's the game of baseball. is super easy. But when you get four- and five-year-olds there for the first game or the first practice, if you've ever been to one of these, you know it is absolute chaos. You get the kids to home play, and they have no clue which way to run in the beginning of a game. They'll run to third base or first base. And, and so what the coach did almost every single practice was he would get co- kids to come over here to home plate. That's where you start. And then he would say, all right, guys, here's what you got to do. You've got to run from home to first to second to third. He'd have them race around there. And if they missed a base on accident, he'd make them run back and hit the base. He, he would do this every single Game. He was trying to teach them a fundamental of baseball or basketball, soccer, almost any sport you play. The fundamental of that is you need to go the right direction. If you don't go the right direction, then the game of baseball is not going to work out very well for you. And so uh, in our backyard, we would set up first, second, and third base and teach him to go the right direction. Uh, the second fundamental that he would teach us parents and teach the kids, uh, the second one was play your position. Again, in the game of baseball, playing your position is incredibly important. Uh, The first game, they just have no clue what to do. So you send them out and say, hey, go to first base. The kid has no clue where they're going. They all just uh, hit the ball, and everyone just flocks to the ball and runs to it. And and there's nobody at first base to throw the ball to. It's a madhouse. 
if you don't tell them where to go. So my son's coach, he was a genius, and so he'd walk out on the field, and he'd take these little rubber things. He would set them down at first base, right outside of first base, and then he would walk over to second base, and he would set one there and say, all right, you've got to stay here, and he'd go over to shortstop and say, you've got to stay here. All nine spots on the field, he would set these little rubber things and say, hey, this is your position to play. Because he knows, again, if somebody hits the ball, uh, that everybody's going to flock to it. So he'd say, hey, buddy, this is your spot, okay? No matter what you do, if the ball's hit somewhere, you grab the ball, and then you throw it to first place, first base. And then, if it's not coming towards you, don't run and chase the ball. This is your spot. So as you look at butterflies in the sky, and as you look at the airplanes passing by, as you walk around kicking dirt, uh, if you have to go potty, First of all, please use the porta potty. Don't do it right here in this spot. Little boys love to do that. Um, and so he would say, after you're done using the potty, come back to this spot. Play your position. There's not a position that's better or worse. They're all equal. And if someone doesn't play their position right, things get a little messy in that game of baseball. And the last thing that he taught the kids, and probably the most important thing, was keep your eye on the ball. You've got to keep your eye on the ball in the game of baseball. It'll keep you from getting a hit in the nose. And when you're batting, you've got to keep your eye on the ball or you're never going to hit the ball. Keeping your eye on the ball is so critical to the game of baseball or soccer or basketball. Keeping your eye on the ball is important. My son could have had a team of nine people show up in their jerseys looking really, really nice and cute. And then there could have been another team of nine people that would show up with their jerseys looking really nice and cute. But without a baseball... The game can't be played. See, the idea of baseball is that there's a ball that the pitcher has, and he throws it, and then the batter responds to the ball, and he hopefully hits it, and then somebody else responds to what happens in the ball. They pick it up, and they throw it to first. The entire game of baseball is about a response to the baseball. It's key. It's critical to that game. And so as I've been watching this chaos unfold and and turn a little bit more into an organized sport over the last uh, few months... And I've been reading this book of Titus and hearing these messages. I've started to think that I think Paul was giving some of these basic same fundamentals to his new church. There was this new team growing up, a new team of a church that he was trying to say, hey, guys, I know it's chaotic where we're at. I know that you don't naturally just know how to do this stuff. So I'm going to give you some fundamentals to turn chaos a little bit into order. And so that's what Paul starts to do by writing these letters to churches. He does this in uh, the book of Titus as well. And so he's giving these same basic instructions that we've heard about already, and we're going to hear some more of these basic instructions uh, specifically this morning in Titus chapter 2. So if you've got Bibles, I'd love you to turn to Titus, uh, the second chapter. We're going to go through the first few verses. If you don't, you can turn there on your digital device. We'll have it on the screen. But before that, let's just pray before... Uh, Jumping into God's word, I don't think we can do that too much. God, you are are good. Even in the middle of a crazy, chaotic place, uh, you are good. In the best of our times, you are still better. In the worst of our times, you are still good. And, And God, I pray that as we jump into scripture today, God, I know that there's no pressure if we just go through scripture. There's not pressure on me because your word is the thing that changes people's lives. I've got nothing great to say outside of your word, which is the vehicle that changes hearts and lives. And so I'm grateful that we get to go through your word this morning. God, would you speak to us? Would we not leave here without hearing and knowing we connected with the creator of the universe who is longing to connect with us this morning? God, we pray this in your holy, humble name. Amen. So we're going to start, like I said, in Titus uh, 1, and we're going to start, I mean, Titus 2, and we're going to start in verse 1, and it's, it's pretty simple uh, saying here. It says, you, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. I'm not going to dive a ton into this this week because last week Wendell and Glenn really handled this text really well where it, it talked about the idea of sound doctrine being so critical, so important. And, and Glenn talked a little bit last week about this idea that sometimes when it comes to sound doctrine or the gospel or Jesus, we have a tendency to maybe have this Jesus plus gospel. 
This, this Jesus plus gospel that says, hey, I got Jesus, but plus I need to you know, watch the right movies or have the right vocation or have the right little kids and all of those things. And, and Glenn uh, graciously encouraged us to not to fall into that trap of this Jesus plus gospel, adding to the gospel. I think another thing that we tend to want to do is kind of subtract from the gospel. I think increasingly in our culture, there's going to be this temptation to want to subtract from what the gospel is, uh, particularly the exclusivity of who Jesus is. We live in a world where sin becomes a little bit more gray, and and the things that we once did, they they kind of mesh with the church and the world cultures, and and those things kind of begin to mesh a little bit. And we live in a world where people look at Christians, and they're like, hey, you guys a little closed-minded, okay? There's a lot of religions that teach a lot of moral things. And hey, if you guys could just open up your minds a little bit and understand, really all places go to the same place. And we have this temptation increasingly in our culture to want to bow down to that and, and lose the fact that, no, Jesus says, hey, I am the only way to heaven. You cannot come to heaven except through me. And so we have this tendency to maybe want to minimize who Jesus is in the gospel. And when we do that, that is not practicing sound doctrine. It starts to send us around the bases in the wrong direction. So this is, this is just Paul's first uh, attempt at saying, hey, go the right direction. And he repeats this over and over again in this piece of scripture. And the second place he, he jumps into is some specific instructions. And so we'll see Paul uh, and the rest of this, uh, these next nine verses give some specific instructions to people. Uh, as he's writing this church, and I mean, as he's writing this letter to a uh, church and to his friend Titus and trying to bring some order to the chaos inside of this new team that was planted, this new church, he wants to give some sound instruction. And so as we go over this, I want to encourage you and let you know this isn't like an exhaustive list of of what you need to do. It's not a uh, a list to just help ratify your moral behavior and and give you this nice list to check a box every single week. But he's looking at each age group that he's going to be specifically talking about. First, uh, older men and then uh, older women and then younger men and younger women. And if you think I'm going to tell you where that divide is, you're crazy. Um, I'll let you decide that yourself. But he goes into all these instructions with these people, and I think he looks... Uh, at their lives, and he sees specific temptations that as we move on to each level and each position of our life, everyone is equally important, but there's some specific temptations that we might fall into. And so for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through every single one, but I'm going to highlight one in each of these that he specifically really hones in on for each generation. And so the first one, he he goes by and he starts talking to uh, older men. And Uh, As Joe said, as we learn this uh, throughout the the scripture and as we learn this throughout the book of Titus, the importance of understanding this is that gospel believing, he wants them to understand sound doctrine, is going to lead to gospel living. And so this is an important reiteration of what he's trying to say as he goes into verse 2 here. He says, teach older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. And the one spot that that Paul really only talks about to the older men is that last word, endurance. He's saying to older men, hey, I think there's this tendency in that culture back then and even a tendency in our culture now is that, hey, we live lives to work for the first two-thirds of our lives. We have these careers and our entire life is going to school so we can get the job and then we work up for retirement so that in the last one-third of our life we can lower our handicap and we can also uh, fix up that 55 Chevy that we got from our dad when we were 16 and we can just coast. And Paul's saying, hey, I don't want you to do that. Not that lowering your handicap is a bad deal or fixing up a car. You've worked hard and it's okay to have some time off. But Paul's encouraging these people, hey, your life is not designed to just start coasting. God designed you to be a worker and that doesn't just stop once you retire. But God wants you to continue to work and press on and endure in the gospel. We read this throughout the Bible. We see this in Joshua 14. There's this guy named Caleb who was a spy who went into the promised land, and he had faith and confidence that one day this promised land would be taken when a bunch of other guys didn't. And so at age 40, Caleb goes, and and he has this vision, and he says, I think we can take that thing. And then we continue to read on and, and to Joshua, and in Joshua 14, we finally see Caleb at 85 years old, And finally, the day has come where they're able to take this promised land. And we don't see Caleb say, all right, guys, you go do it. I'll send a check in the mail. No, Caleb says, somebody get me my walker, get me a sword, and we are going to go take this mountain today. 
And so Caleb did not, he did not stop. He wanted to endure. And so older men, my encouragement to you, I think Paul's encouragement, God's encouragement to us is just keep enduring. Do not stop. Do not fall into the trap to think that the best days of your life are already done. No, I believe that the best days of your life are still ahead of you, and God's got great, incredible plans if you'd let him use you. A couple of weeks ago, I had a, an amazing opportunity to go to Chicago, inner city Chicago, with some eighth grade students in our ministry, and, and it was an amazing trip. And on this particular trip, we hung out with another church from uh, Osage, Iowa, Osage Alliance. And they brought... Um, a different set of folks to our, our group. We had eighth graders and they had everybody over 60, um, which was awesome for our students. And there was one gentleman in particular, his name was Craig. And Craig was a 69-year-old farmer from Osage, Iowa. If you picture a farmer from Iowa and close your eyes, that is Craig. <laughs> and Craig was an awesome guy and, and he had never been on a mission trip before in his entire life. And there's this new pastor in town that wanted to encourage him and a bunch of people in the congregation that had never been on a trip before to come and experience this inner city Chicago. And he told him, you're going to be hanging out with a bunch of eighth graders, and, and so I think God's going to do amazing things in your life. And it was fun to see Craig progress throughout the week, to see Craig's heart for mission and his willingness to even jump and go on. Uh, this trip, he doesn't have to go on his trip. He could have just easily wrote a check and sent other people on this trip. But Craig, by the encouragement of his pastor, said, hey, I want to continue to endure, and I believe God's got something great for me this week. Craig told us as we were hanging out uh, during the week, he's like, guys, I'm going to be honest. I live in the middle of Iowa. I, I don't see a lot of things. The things that I do see around the world and inner cities and big places like Omaha are just crime and, and the reality that the church is just falling apart and the church is not gonna be around very soon. So I haven't spent a lot of my life investing into the church, but he saw our eighth grade students and he was amazed. He was amazed to hear eighth graders say crazy things like, I prayed and God spoke to me. He was encouraged by a group of eighth graders, and he said, hey, I have this newfound joy, this newfound hope that I'm going to endure and not settle for the previous 69 years of my life being amazing, but I'm going to make these next few years of my life be the most amazing. He caught this bug for missions, and I am excited to watch what Craig continues to do in the future as he endures through the power of the Holy Spirit. So older men, would you endure? Would you continue to run the right direction, fix your eyes on sound doctrine? Would you continue to play your position? It is so important. Would you continue to endure and would you continue to fix your eyes on the gospel? Because like a, a baseball, Paul wants to invite us to fix our eyes on the gospel. As Christians, uh, just like the baseball is the key to playing the game of baseball, if we show up and we don't have our eyes on the gospel and we don't live our lives in a response to the gospel, then we're just like a team that sent a bunch of people out there with really nice jerseys on that don't get to play the game, but our lives are designed to be a response to the gospel. So older men, would you fix your eyes on the gospel and continue to respond to that? The next verse goes on to another group of people. It says, likewise, teach older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to too much wine, but to teach what is good. And again, I'm not going to go through everything, and I don't think this is an entirely exhaustive list of things, but it's great sound advice. The first part, he says, be reverent. And that simply, it simply means to just live a temple-fitting life. All the women, remember that inside of you lives the Holy Spirit, that your body, your heart, your soul is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Would you live a life that models that you have the living God of the universe residing inside of you? Would you be reverent? And he says, don't be slanderers. Hey, don't be the place where the gossip mill maybe starts or don't be the place where it says, hey, the church is totally falling apart. Would you be the place that that ends? When people come up to you and you, they say, hey, this, this church is falling apart. The young people, they have no clue what they're doing. Everything is going terrible. The world is falling apart. The sky is falling. Have you seen the news lately? Be the place that says, hey, no, I see people in a church that I need to speak life into. Be a place where you're teaching what is good to the younger generation. I believe that if you are a person who, who speaks life 
where there's darkness. I believe that if you're a person whose life exemplifies the, pack, the fact that the power of the Holy Spirit is residing inside of you, that people are going to see an amazing picture, a beautiful picture of what the gospel is. So older women, my encouragement to you today is to continue to run the right direction. Fix your eyes on, on sound doctrine. Know what is right. Go the right direction around the bases, even when other people aren't. Would you play your position? Your position is incredibly important. Would you train up younger women? Would you love younger women? Would you invest in younger women? Would you invest in the church? Would you speak life? Would you be prayer warriors in the church? And would you continue to fix your eyes on the gospel? Would your life be lived as a response to that gospel? We continue on to the next group of people. It says, then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and to be pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. If you've ever met anybody who is not a fan of Christianity, who might say that Christianity is old and archaic and that it's not really working, that we're chauvinistic, that we like to put women down and that men are superior and that's how we do life and that's how we roll, then this might be the ammunition that they might fire at you. They might find this scripture in Titus 2 and try to twist it a little bit and say, hey, Christianity is a life that I don't wanna be a part of. It's old, it's, it's antiquated, it is not a good thing. But can I tell you that's not what Paul is doing here? Actually, I think it's pretty much the opposite of what Paul's doing here. First of all, he's not giving uh, instructions. He's instructing older women who have lived life to give instructions to these younger women. So he's not saying, hey, here's this list of what you, you need to do in your life. But Paul is saying, hey, I'm going to give you some sound instruction, some encouragement from the older women who should encourage you in life to do this. The first uh, of those might seem really silly, like love your uh, husbands and love uh, your kids. Can I, I'm just a husband, okay? I'm a husband, I'm a dad. Can I speak to husbands and dads just for a second? Uh, despite what you think, you are not always that lovable. <laughs> we laugh, but it's true. Despite what I think, I am not always that lovable. I just do boneheaded things. I leave the seat up sometimes. I spend too much money. I spend too many hours at work sometimes. I say mean things to my wife that I shouldn't have said. I don't control my, my tongue. And, and husbands just really are not always that lovable. And so what Paul is saying to, to older women is, hey, you need to remind these younger women that they need to continue to love their husbands even when they're not lovable. I am so grateful for a mother-in-law and women in my life that encourage my wife when I am just a bonehead, when, when I am not a guy that deserves love from my wife, that she continues to love me because she's encouraged by people. I'm so grateful for that. And every time she does that, I believe she is painting a picture of the gospel. And same thing for little kids, right? Little kids are so cute. We just love to pinch their little cheeks and talk about how cute they are. But if you've ever hung out with little kids, <laughs> little kids are not always that lovable. Can we just be honest for a second? Little kids are not always that lovable. And, and sometimes women need to be reminded that when the feelings aren't there, when it's not exciting, when it's the middle of the night, that they have a calling to love even when people are not un even when people are unlovable. And that is a picture of the gospel, the God who loved people who did not deserve love all of the time. And so would you be encouraged to love your husband and love your kids, even though it's hard? Be self-controlled and pure. Those are just easy. Thoughts. I'm not going to expound too much on those. Have self-control. Be pure. Stick to one man. That's a good game plan uh, for you. <laughs> to be busy at home. No, you didn't. I know what you guys are like. Oh, here it goes. Be busy at home. But I don't think what Paul is doing is just giving these instructions to stay home. Actually, could I tell you what Paul's not saying just for a second to disarm us for a moment? He's not saying, hey, never leave your house unless you need to go get groceries. He's, he's not saying that. We laugh, but sometimes we, we feel like this. You're the only one allowed to mop the floor, do the dishes, clean the laundry, do all of those things. Paul's not saying you're the only one allowed to do this. So husbands, don't use this as terrible ammunition and uh, malign the gospel here. 
And Paul isn't saying you cannot have a career. He's not saying be busy only at home. That's not at all what Paul is saying. In fact, we see in Proverbs 31 this, this beautiful picture of, of a great young woman who, who's able to be married and, and she has great qualities about her. And we see her that she's buying fields and she's planting vineyards and she's, she's making things and she's selling them and making money for her family. He's not trying to go back on that, but I think he, he's trying to encourage these young women that what they are doing matters. They need to hear from all the women that what you are doing matters. What you're doing inside of the home, it matters. I uh, am in a journey group that meets every other Thursday with a bunch of people my age, couples my age, and there's uh, husbands and wives in there. We've got a ton of little kids. Like We've multiplied just by having a ton of little kids, and every couple has uh, at least one little kid, all under the age of five. It is chaos when you come to our basement for journey group, but... One of the things that often gets talked about, uh, especially among the women, as they look at other people with careers and as they check out their Facebooks and as they look at other people from uh, inside, outside the window, they, they say, and what, is what I'm doing matter? Does what I'm doing matter? I hang out with little kids and I, I wipe their butts and I do all of these things. And honestly, it's hard work. And there's a real struggle. There's a real struggle for my wife to, to, to believe that what she's doing in our home matters because she sees so much of what other people are doing and broadcasting that seems so much more glamorous. But can I tell you, to be encouraged, what you are doing matters. You are sending ripples into eternity every single time you love your kid, every single time you wake up and, and you make everybody's lunches and they head out the door with giving you a kiss goodbye and nobody thanks you. When you go to work all day long and then after work you become a taxi driver who takes your kids from one place to the next place and then after that you realize it's 9.30 and you got your kids asleep and you've got to settle for ramen noodles for dinner because you didn't even have time to eat anything for yourself because you were so busy serving everyone else. Would you know that what you're doing, it matters. It matters so much. You guys are sending ripples into eternity with your little kids and raising them. It Matter. So would you be encouraged, not discouraged by being busy at home, but would you know that your work inside of the home, it matters and it has eternal impact. It matters. It matters. So would you keep your eyes on the gospel, young women? Would you keep your eyes on the gospel? Would you continue to run the right direction around the bases, know what sound doctrine looks like? Would you play your position? Your position is not less valuable than anybody else's position. Would you play your position? He continues on and says, be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. And as he continues on that, that's kind of one of those other touchy things. And, and Paul talks about this a lot of different places of what submission kind of uh, should look like. And as I was studying and I read from a common commentator, I just wanted to read his thoughts on submission quickly for you. He says, submission is more of an attitude. I might actually have it. I don't have it. I lied. Sorry. Submission is more of an attitude than an action. The one's attitude will certainly determine one's actions, contrary to popular misconceptions. There's no inferiority in submissiveness. In submissiveness. We see this plainly in the Trinity, where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all equally God, and yet for the purpose of redemption... Something happens. The son submits his assignment to the father. See, submissiveness isn't like this bad word that's an archaic. I think when we do marriage right, when the husband lives a life and loves his wife like Christ loves the church, when he says, hey, I'm gonna give up my preferences and give up the things that sometimes I prefer to love you better, that we're actually painting a picture of the gospel to people. When our marriages look like that and when wives are submissive to their husbands and they love them and for the sacrifice of redemption and they submit, it's actually this beautiful picture of what the gospel looks like. It's this amazing dance that goes back and forth and back and forth and people are able to see the gospel lived out through your marriage. I don't think anybody can watch a marriage like that and say that's old, that's archaic, that is not a good thing, but what they see is the gospel. So young woman, would you continue to practice sound doctrine? Would you Run the right direction. Would you play your position as, as a wife and as a mother? Would you do that with great joy? And as you do it, would you fix your eyes on the gospel and live your life as a response to that? We go on to the next group of people. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. 
and everything, set them a good example by doing what is good. Paul just keeps it real here, okay? With the young man, he's like, I'm not even gonna give you guys a list at all. You don't need a list, okay? I know what the Achilles heel of most young men is and you guys aren't self-controlled. You just cannot control yourselves. If you guys could maybe control your tongue and you could control your actions, you could control your hormones, all of those things. If you could just, just self-control, guys, okay? And that's a reality. It's a reality for most young men is that self-control is a really, really, really hard thing. In fact, in Proverbs 25, 28, it says, a man without self-control is like a city whose walls have been broken through. When we live lives without self-control, it's like the walls have just been broken down and anybody, the enemy can just rush in and overtake us. Uh, another guy phrased it a different way and, and it totally rocked me and I put it on my, in my office so I could read this and be reminded of this every single day as a young man uh, myself. And, and he says, his name is J.C. Riley, he says, being ruled by the desires of your body will murder your soul. Guys, when we are ruled by the desires of our body and the temptations, our souls are just murdered. And we've got to protect that. We've got to say we need to be self-controlled. Every time we live with self-control, we're painting a picture of the gospel. When those thoughts are swimming around your mind and you stay away from the computer, when you get really angry and that rage wants to come at you because somebody did something wrong or they upset you and, and you hold in that self-control, you're painting a picture of the gospel. When you don't give people what you think they deserve, you're painting a picture of the gospel. When you say no to one more drink or hit or whatever, when everybody else is giving it to you, when you love your family and serve them instead of your video games and you practice self-control, you're actually painting a picture of the gospel. So, young men, would we run the right direction? Would we stay true to what is sound doctrine? Would we play our positions, have self-control, don't be ruled by the desires of our body. Would we keep our eyes on the gospel to live a life that responds to it? And it goes on and says, teach your slaves to be subject to their masters and everything, to try to please them, not to talk back, talk back to them and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. I don't have time to get into all the differences between slavery and scripture and slavery inside of our minds and American slavery, but I can tell you they're, they're a lot different than, uh, than what we think. But the reality is, whether we want to admit it or not, is pretty much all of us in this room are slaves to something. Maybe we get to pick uh, what we're slaves to, like the job that we chose, but we're slaves to that because... We've got to work that job in order to get money to put food on the table. And so we have to do that every single day, every single day, every single day, even if we love it, to put, mo to put food on the table. And students in the room, most of you feel like, literally, that you're slaves to your school, that you're locked inside of this prison and that you can't get out and you feel like you're a slave inside of that place that you don't have a choice to be in. But all of us as slaves of our employers or maybe slaves of our school, we all have a choice to make the gospel look attractive, to make Jesus look attractive by living lives with integrity, by not cheating, not trying to undercut other people so we can climb higher than them, by not cheating on the tests in our school, by living lives as servants and not disrespecting those who are our superiors, even if we don't uh, agree with them all the time. But when we do this, when we live lives as slaves to the environments that we are in, the, day, the, the places that we give the best hours of our life, when we live as slaves and we serve and we're humble and we love well. When we have integrity, we get to point people to an amazing picture of the gospel. So workers and, and teammates and employers and students, would we, would we get this? Would we fix our eyes on the gospel? Just like in baseball, would we respond to that message? Would our entire lives be lived as a response to that? Because guys, I, I promise you, if we do this, it makes Jesus look really attractive to the people around us. Here's my fear sometimes in, in a message like this that has kind of a list and maybe some instructions is that we would just leave here and want to check a box or two, maybe be a little bit more self-controlled, play one less video game this week, that we would say a really nice thing as an older woman to a younger woman or maybe as a, 
as an older man, sign up for a mission trip, which is a really cool thing, or as a younger woman, say I love you a few more times to your kid, and those are all really good things. But here's my fear in a message like this is that we would just have some kind of behavior modification. And there's not a call to modify our behavior. The call is to keep our eyes fixed on the gospel, to keep our eyes fixed on the reality that we were once dead in our transgressions, that we were all messy people, but because Jesus stepped in and loved us when we didn't deserve it, we have an amazing hope in the world that we would fix our eyes on the gospel and live our entire lives as a response to that gospel. Not that we would gather here every single week and, and we would sing some songs and that we would uh, change up the game plan and just tweak it a little bit and, and fix our behaviors a little bit. No, that's not the hope. The hope is that our lives would be lived by the power of the gospel. As, as Paul says in Romans 1.16, he says, hey, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus because it is the power it's the power for salvation, that we wouldn't live lives ashamed of the gospel, but people would see through the way that we act, empowered by the gospel, something different. I don't believe that if we do any of these things that the world can really look at it and say, that's archaic, that's not good, I'm not gonna do that, but I think they will be so attracted to people who, when they shouldn't have any hope, have hope who when they shouldn't have joy, have joy, who people who had totally crazy, messed up lives and they were totally wretched sinners, but then amazing grace stepped in and saved their life. When people see that, when we're vulnerable and people see the power of the gospel that transformed our life, I think they'll want to say, I want some of that. I'll close with this. In this very room this week, I got to see an amazing display of the gospel. And I don't tell you this story as a prescription of what it needs to look like, but I tell you this story because it was so attractive to me that I said, I want more of that. And I think everybody else that sat in this room thought the same thing. As I sat at a funeral for a young man a couple days away from being 12 years old, and I watched his parents walk up right here where I'm standing on this stage and I watched and listened to her say these words. She said, friends, it would grieve me, and I think it would grieve my son more if his life or death caused anyone to doubt the goodness of God. I realized that God carried him away from us. We no longer have the physical son with us, laughing or playing and joking and dabbing. And it's okay to grieve the loss of him and everything he's meant to us, but never let it lead you to the conclusion that God isn't good. On the contrary, he's nothing but good. And now I'm gonna pray like my son taught me to pray a couple days before he passed. God, thank you for what I've been through and that you were with me. And thank you for a family that loves me. I, I looked in this room and I don't think there's a person in this room that could have said, that's crazy. That was the gospel on display. In the middle of the hopeless situation, they heard a gospel message of hope that even when things are bad and things are broken, that we have hope. And to see a mom step up and raise her hands and sing the, the words, you are a good, good father. I don't think there's a soul in the room that could have said, I don't want that hope. I don't want that gospel that even in the midst of the worst time in their life, there's hope. So friends, in our lives, whatever it is in your life, would you live it as a response to the gospel? Just like a bunch of five-year-olds and a baseball team, you cannot play the game without your eyes being fixed on the baseball. If you do, you're just gonna strike out. Church, if we try to do life, if we try to do church, if we try to do community without our eyes fixed on the gospel, we're gonna have the same result. We're gonna strike out. Hey, let's pray before we head out of here. God, I'm so grateful that you are good, that there is so much hope inside of the gospel that if we would live with our eyes fixed on, if we would go the right direction, if we would play the positions that you've put us in for right now, God, and if we would live lives as a power and a response to the gospel, then our neighbors, our friends, everybody that we work with, they would find it so attractive. 
God, so would you empower us to do this today? In a world that might be full of chaos, as people who might be new to the team or people who might have been playing for a while but took their eyes off the gospel and feel like they've been striking out, would we realign and refocus our vision on the gospel and would we live in that power? Not because of what we've done, but because of what you've done, would we live with that power? God, we pray this, we ask this in your holy and humble name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, church, thank you so much for joining us today. As you leave, would you fix your eyes on the gospel and live lives that are responsible? Be blessed. We will see you soon.